Today, I will show you an action, crime, sci-fi film from 2016, titled Virtual Revolution. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. It's the year 2047, considered a century of technological revolution. Humanity has reached important milestones like flying cars and robots, but what has changed society the most is the creation of virtual worlds, called verses that feel as authentic as reality itself. 75% of the population, known as the connected, don't care about their real lives anymore and spend their entire day online, so towns and cities belong to a minority. There are others who spend half their time online and half in the real world, those are called hybrids. In Neo Paris lives shadow agent Nash Trenton, a hybrid haunted by the death of his love. Helena in a virus attack a few years back. He's part of an adventuring party in a fantasy verse where they fight bad guys with swords, bows, and magic. One of the party members, Dalwin, is in a relationship with him even if they don't know each other in the real world. One evening, after the group successfully defeats a powerful mage, Nash logs out a bit earlier than usual because he's summoned by Dina, an executive from Centurnus Corporation, which is one of the major companies in charge of the verses. 148 players have been killed in a computer virus attack perpetrated by an insurgent group called Necromancers, so Dina wants Nash to find out the identities of those insurgents. While it's true the attacks and the body count have become much worse, calling Interpol isn't an option, their systems get hacked all the time and if they got involved, Centurnus wouldn't be able to target the Necromancers directly. Nash visits the location behind the IP address that released the virus, it's easy for him to break in because the streets are empty thanks to everyone being inside playing their games. It's an old abandoned building, and Nash finds nothing inside but trash, until he hears a noise. With his gun at the ready, he follows the sound he heard, and is suddenly jumped on by a big bald man, and the two of them begin a fist fight. After many punches, kicks, and throws against the wall, the man overpowers Nash and, after dropping him on the floor, steals his ID before leaving. Nash's next destination is in a dubious neighborhood with actual people on the streets offering a variety of shady services. There, Nash visits his friend and former brother-in-law Morel, who happens to be an expert hacker. After Morel stitches him up, Nash asks him to hack into Interpol's systems and get him the security camera records from the building he just visited so he can identify the guy that beat him up. Morel accepts in exchange for illegal hardware that Nash can obtain from his clients. Nash angrily leaves when Morel suddenly brings up Helena, making the conversation awkward. Even if Nash knows Morel is right to think there's something off with his sister's death. Sometime later, Nash is spending his evening with Dalwin in the game when he's interrupted by the doorbell in the real world. It's Morel, bringing him news about the security camera records. Sadly, no big bald man has walked in front of the camera, however, he did find a guy who appeared several times during the last three days before Nash's arrival, although he didn't appear to be a fighter. All this information has been put in a flash drive that Nash takes to Dina, who uses the company's software to identify the mysterious man, his name is Leonard Lorenz, and they have his address as well, so Nash goes to pay him a visit. He enters the apartment through the window and finds Leonard connected to the virtual world. He isn't alone, however, the bald man is also there, ready to start another fistfight. This time though, after all the thrown kicks and punches, Nash doesn't stay still on the floor when he's thrown there, instead, he takes out his gun and shoots the bald guy. After shooting Leonard as well and recovering his ID, Nash sits on Leonard's chair and takes control of his character to work undercover and find more information about the necromancers. The avatar turns out to be a blonde woman that is currently in the middle of enjoying some pleasure in bed with two other girls, Nash pays them no attention and gets the character dressed before leaving the building with a weapon he found in the room too. There's a necromancer soldier waiting outside called John, who mentions they've received 
orders to go back to headquarters immediately. The game therein is a shooter, so John and Nash enter the war area and decide to take advantage of the two factions fighting a giant robot called Cerberus because it means they won't pay much attention to them. While crossing an abandoned building, John's binoculars stop working, which is proof of a scrambler machine and therefore an ambush as well. There's no other path they can take, though, they need to go as deep as possible into the PvP zone because it's harder for players to survive there and safer for them since they won't run into an agent randomly, so they keep going and meet the ambush with open fire. By making a swift job of covering each other and shooting with outstanding aim, the pair manages to take down all the regular soldiers, but there's one final enemy left, the boss, who is now appearing at the end of the hallway and blocking the way. It's a tall man holding an extra-large machine gun and wearing armor, making him difficult to kill, but John has a plan. He throws a flash grenade to distract him while Nash walks behind a wall and approaches him from behind, gaining the opportunity to shoot him directly in the head. After stealing his ammunition, John and Nash run away and manage to reach the necromancers' headquarters without any more trouble. Waiting there for them is the person in charge of the whole operation, Camel, who asks a subordinate to bring over a beacon before asking them for any news. They know a mysterious man working solo has visited their buildings, and now they're being chased by Interpol as well. Camel admits they need to change tactics, currently, they're trying to scare gamers off so they lead their verses, but the media is covering up the deaths and everyone believes them to be an urban legend. He doesn't reveal what his new plan is, though, because at that moment, the subordinate brings over the requested beacon, which prevents Nash from disconnecting. The soldiers grab Nash's avatar and reveal they've known it's not Leonard in their all along because he didn't make the rallying sign when he came in. Camel punches him, but he knows negative feelings are decreased online, so he sends his men to log out outside the room and find Nash's body in the real world. While Camel explains how much interest politicians and companies have in keeping society in a vegetative state, Nash takes the chance to headbutt one of the soldiers and activate the grenade on the belt of the other soldier, which causes an explosion that destroys the beacon. He wakes up in the real world just in time to shoot the real John and his partner as they enter the apartment. Nash visits Morel again to ask him about devices that prevent people from logging out, but Morel doesn't think that can be done, so instead, Nash gives him the in-game coordinates of the necromancer's headquarters and asks Morel for the records detailing every person that has logged in or out in that area. Their investigation is interrupted when three men from Interpol arrive, so Nash hides while the guy in charge, Stilson, interrogates his friend. At first, Morel doesn't want to talk, but after he gets punched by one of the agents, he starts to confess. He never mentions Nash's name, though, he just admits having hacked the Interpol database and selling the information to one of the minor gaming companies, he also works on testing security systems for the bigger corporations. Seeing as he didn't find anything important on the camera recordings, the three men leave. After Stilson informs him they'll be requiring his services in the future in exchange for not arresting him over his illegal hardware. Nash also leaves after Morel promises to look into those coordinates he gave him. Thinking the necromancers still don't know his identity, Nash returns to his apartment and goes online to have another adventure with his party and enjoy some sweet moments with Dalwyn. But once again, he's interrupted by a request from Dina to see him. She informs him Interpol has been to the company building because they know of the deaths, and in return, Nash tells her what he's found out, thanks to Morel snooping. The attacks have been launched only against the three biggest versus companies, but other than that, the trail has seemed to go cold. It's been impossible to track down the necromancers, because there are no connections or disconnections. In the system, they always leave a few subordinates online, so that they can protect the area from other players and log in or out elsewhere. 
Dina still wants him to solve this as quickly as possible because she doesn't want to have Interpol around, they may be allies, but they aren't friends. This means the versus companies pay the government their taxes, and that money is used to pay the connected universal income, who in return pay for the game. For the government, paying for a connected's little necessities is much cheaper than maintaining a person living a full life, and the connected don't usually live longer than 40 years. Anyway. After asking Morel to hack into the Interpol database to learn what they know about the attacks, Nash goes back to his apartment, where he's ambushed by the necromancers. He meets the real Camel, who is actually a woman that tells him he shouldn't work for Sinternus Corporation because they've lied about Helena's death. It wasn't a necromancer attack that killed her, it was a virus that Sinternus created. And the necromancers nearly adapted for their cause later. Helena was actually close to the necromancers, even if she didn't always approve of their methods, she was still part of them, and that made her a target for Sinternus. Because he's always thought there was something wrong with Helena's death, Nash believes Camel's story and accepts to help them, telling them all he knows and preparing a plan to take care of Interpol. Stilson and his agents follow one of the necromancer's men, and Nash helps him lose them by guiding him through the sewers. He takes him back to Camel, who asks him to share with them any information he may learn from his hacker friend in the future. When visiting Morel, Nash admits feeling used by both Sinternus and the Necromancers, and Morel points out none of this will bring Helena back before informing him the Interpol will be soon meeting with a mole they have among Camel's group. Nash goes to the meeting point only to be captured by Interpol, who made up the story about a mole to trick him into coming and ambush him. Stilson knows Nash is working for both Sinternus and the Necromancers, so he wants him to be an informant for Interpol as well. However, their negotiations are interrupted by Camel and her men who have been following Nash in case he needed help and now are killing every single Interpol agent in sight. Now that he's off the radar again, Nash wants to hear about the new plan, and Camel accepts to fill him in after returning to his place. The necromancer's goal is to free all the connected. To achieve it, they're going to use a virus one of their men has created, which has the power to shut down every console until the verses themselves disappear. This will force people offline and make them go outside again. There's only one issue, in order to be able to replicate and spread, the virus needs to be launched from within the matrix of one of the main verses. This is where Nash comes in, he could easily take the virus into Sinternus' main offices and keep it there while the hackers do their thing. Campbell promises the virus attacks progressively and by the time it's out there, he won't even be in the building anymore and they wouldn't be able to track it back to him, so he accepts. Since there are a few hours left before they start the mission, Nash gets online and meets with Dalwin, who is a connected and doesn't want to put labels on their relationship, which gives Nash a lot to think about. Moments later, he visits Dina at the Sinternus building and while talking to her, he secretly activates the device with the virus. The necromancer's hackers immediately start working on spreading their attack while Nash returns home and gets online again for one last adventure with his party, but there. Interrupted by incoming messages from Morel that reveal the hackers' plans and call for everyone in Neo Paris to stop them. A furious mob of connected people that were forced out of the game against their will reach the necromancer's location and kill every single one of them before they can destroy all the verses. Sometime after the incident was over, Nash is once again summoned by Dina, who suspects he was the one that brought the virus inside her office but won't get him arrested because thanks to this, they were able to crush the necromancers. However, she does sever all the ties between Sinternus and Nash on account of his betrayal. She also tells him Camel lied to him, the virus that killed Helena was the necromancers. Improved version, and she had only become close to the group because she was working for Sinternus as an informant. Not knowing who to believe and to escape these painful thoughts, Nash goes online permanently. 
and becomes another connected, deciding to live the rest of his life with Dowlin and their party. Thanks to the money he's earned, he can add features and comforts to his online avatar to make him enjoy the experience even more fully, and since his brain can't distinguish between real and virtual, the online life is as good as real.